So here we go. Scuba Obsessed Weekly Podcast. We talk about all things scuba diving from cool new gear to places to dive and scuba the news. Scuba Obsessed episode 491 is recorded live. Let's see. We are in April 22nd, 2020. Welcome back to Scuba Obsessed. I'm Darren Jolson coming to you from the southwest side of the great state of Michigan. And joining me this week, we have Dak. We have Dak. We have Mac, the dive mentor. How you doing today, Mac? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I didn't have to use my snow blower. I was able to use the lawnmower after the snow. Oh, you had snow. Wednesday. We didn't yes, have did. any snow whatsoever. I remember they were calling for three inches, and I never saw it. So you you did get it. How much? How much well, stuck? Not a, no accumulation. It was a nice uh, snow globe for a couple of hours. But my cousin down there in South Bend area, they got an inch or so. And further south, they got more. Wow. I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Uh, I, I, yeah, better than Well, us. in Missouri, they, had, they said they had three inches in the morning. And then by noon, it was completely gone and nice outside. That's the way you want it. Yeah. I did see a nice video of a guy out mowing his lawn, or I should say mowing the snow. M- mowing the snow. What was he? He, he was literally. It it, it, so he took his push mower into the yard, yeah. and then he was just mowing, the grass. mowing it. Okay. And it, it moved the snow. <laughs> It'll move something. I just wish it would move the moles. That's, that's a problem I have in now. They're getting active. I did mow my yard yesterday. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're... and uh, you can go there and you go squoosh. Oh yeah, squoosh. <laughs> I'm gonna to have to go and get atomic on them this year. Either that or train the dogs to go and dig them up, one or the other. I want to use that propane device. Have you seen? Oh, that? the uh, there's a couple of good videos. The rotinator. You just squirt. You just put the propane <laughs> in there and then let it go for a couple of seconds. Then you ignite it. Uh-huh. I'm sure it would upset the neighbors all when their ground went. <laughs> but so, so that was the one the that. Uh, let me see if I can find that here, so we can share that. We're going to try out. So, so uh, this is we've done some YouTube over the years uh, with mixed results, but this is the first time doing a live stream. So it's an unlisted live stream this week. Uh, we're uh, let's see, was that Rodinator? Eight thousand is it eight hundred or five thousand? Let's see here. Well, the one I liked was a guy out west where he had the prairie dog hills. He blew those suckers up big time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try. So we'll do a transition here. So this is that rotinator. Yeah, I'm gonna have to come up with a different different way of showing YouTube stuff. I'll have to do <laughs> this is pretty bad. Uh, but what I, what I've got Mac that you're not seeing is I've got the YouTube video mm-hmm. playing, and this is the one where the guy he's, he's got the the hose and he stuck the hose into the ground. Uh, and he's got the rotinator, and let's see what we are. This is 2019 blowing up moles. Uh, so yeah, we're about 45 seconds in. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that would shake the neighbors oh, up. It would. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I saw that part. Just I don't think. Her- no, could you imagine yeah. what uh, will happen <laughs> if you if you get that going? There'd be a lot of phone calls from my neighborhood. I, yeah, I, I picture a few car alarms going off. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, wow. Yeah, that, there you go. I don't think doing it at night would be good either. No. <laughs> no, I don't really think there is a good way of doing that. It's a fun way. I would certainly like to do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, explosives, getting rid of moles all at the same time. <laughs> I, now there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. Uh, put a little bit too much gas in, the gas runs into your basement. 
the house goes in the yard. <laughs> hey, hazards. Yeah, yeah. So that might that might not be the the best. So let's go ahead and just try out this scuba the news thing on this. So this will be a little bit of an experiment as well. We're going to have the article up on the screen. Uh, we'll have links down in the show notes, which, I mean, that's going to be down below when we get around to editing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this first one is former Michigan man led a $1 million cocaine organization planning to use underwater drone to send drugs to Europe. I'm thinking that we did not have the right monetization idea for our dive club because I, I think we, 100 million, we could have done something with that. Uh, I always like the words conspiracy too because that means he didn't get it done. Conspiracy to distribute. Well, of course, they're, they're, they want to show how well they did in, in stopping this. So the federal officials arrested the Michigan resident who was the leader of the massive hundred million dollar international cocaine trafficking organization that planned to use an underwater drone to ship drugs to Europe. So there's plans. So that's kind of indicating that maybe they weren't too successful. Yali, was it Didion 43 has been charged with conspiracy to distribute cocaine acting United States attorney, uh, Sam S Mosen announced authorities from Farmington Hills, Sterling Heights, Troy, Novi, Dearborn Hearts, Heights and Northfield Township are involved in the investigation in this case, according to federal officials. Federal officials said they uh, uh, did any and others planned and financed the distribution of cocaine from several places, including the Eastern District of Michigan. Uh, he received at least $550,000 from others to purchase bulk cocaine twice in June 2016 and December 2017. Federal indictment claims. Is accused of being part of a group that used private airplanes and commercial containers to distribute cocaine throughout Europe, official said. Uh, and then in 2019 2020, 3,400 kilograms of cocaine uh, were seized by officials with a street value of 100 million. This, according to authorities, they said this is very significant, important prosecution, a large sale, scale well-organized drug trafficking organization involved distribution of thousands of kilograms of cocaine worth tens of millions of dollars across multiple continents. Uh, Didion was arrested on March 31st in Charlotte, North Carolina. A criminal complaint unsealed the following day accused him of being the leader of an international drug trafficking organization. Now, I want to see photos. Where's photos of this uh, drone that he was building? And then... And you didn't hear you didn't hear much about the drone though because if you're going to do it, you're going to have to get a sophisticated drone for mapping, which you should be able to get from a different country mm -hmm. who's doing scientific research. Get it from them, plan it from A to B. I don't see why you couldn't do that. Yeah, and well, from Cuba to here, you know that's where they're doing shipping. That yep. sounds like a really smart way to do it. Yeah. It says, uh, Fed said the drone would have been equipped with an underwater modem and a GPS antenna. It would have uh, used to take the cocaine overseas while attached to the bomb of a commercial container ship, according to authorities. Off the shore of Europe, the drone would be remotely released from the container ship and picked up by a fishing boat controlled by the organization. Okay, that's even easier. Yeah. Just attach it with magnet, electronic magnet. Mm -hmm. It's over there. Bingo. Release it. There you go. He's got the plans for it. So, well, that wouldn't even have to be a drone. Matter of fact, you get a like a magnetic mine package, mm -hmm. put it to a hull. When yep. it gets there, let it drop off. You know where it's going to drop. Recover it. There hmm. you go. <laughs> there's, there's some money to be made there. Yeah. Or, or how about a movie? I mean, that'd be a great plot for a movie. Now, since we talked about that, that's not conspiracy, is it? The conspiracy? Are we are we conspiring? No, oh, this is all hypothetical. Well, so was his. He never did it. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, going to being prosecuted for something he never actually got to do. Happens all the time. Well, he thought about it, so it must have been true. Yeah. 
So, so how about this one for the next one? This, this kind of follows up on last week where we had in Australia where they were uh, maiming and killing the uh, rays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and part of that was, and, and then also the bycatch from the nets. So here's a new high-tech shark deterrent to be tested in Cape Cod. It's a, an electronic shark barrier may prov- provide greater safety to anglers and swimmers. Um, the technology is called the Boat Zero One. It delivers a powerful electrical field over 26 feet deep and 19 feet wide. Sharks have a short range electrical receptors in their snout and the Boat 01 electrical field stimulates those receptors causing spasms and turns the shark away. Usually the devices are hung from a buoy and floated behind, but daisy chaining up to four of the Boat 01s together, a large area can be covered. Ocean Guardian also makes an even larger system to use to create shark-free zones at private resorts and in scuba diving and snorkeling areas. Functionally, the Boat 01 may allow fishermen and swimmers greater access to water than they've had in past years. So, huh. so what's Boat 01? That's got to be an acronym, I'm guessing. Everybody wants to do an acronym. Uh, yeah, they really don't say what it means. So is this actually a product? I was going to send you a picture, but I don't know how to do that here. (laughs) Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, you can do the the chat message. Uh, I don't want to screw up. Do do you have? I found the picture. Do you still have Discord? Damn if I know. I don't see it up here. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So okay, let me see. Yeah. See. Well, we'll have to work. We found a picture of it on a different site, and mm-hmm. basically, the people are swimming off the boat and all, and they're hanging these items down in the water. Mm-hmm. Look like two broadcasting sensors, so they have a safe haven swimming around their boat. So when you say, uh, "Oh, so they." So they can put this on a boat then. So you, yeah, so you kind it's, of it's, uh, hanging from the back of a boat. Oh, okay. That's kind of if it works. So you know, it's, it's kind of like the shark chainmail. <laughs> Who's the first one to try it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's another ocean guardian boat. With pictures of what it looks like, and that looks like a big white tub with a sonic transmitter in it, and it cost two thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. So it says it'll uh, provide a large, powerful, protective swimming area of twenty-six feet by nineteen feet. Okay. $3,000. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm just, I'm a, I'm a tweaking some of this, some of the uh, stuff. I think, I think I made the logo a little too obnoxious. So here we just oh. shrink it down a little bit. Let's see, maybe make, make my head a little bigger. My wife will disagree with that. She says my head's already too big. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. Okay, so the next one up on the list is rare at mus- at risk muscles spotted. Save Sickle Point committee teamed up with a local Caledon scuba organization to find rare endangered Rocky Mountain Ridge mussels in Skara Lake, a species unique to the Okanag, O-K-A-N-A-G-A-N Valley in all of Canada. Okan, again, I mean, it's got to be a word simple as Michigan, but until I hear it, I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing it. So we'll call it O-Valley, <laughs> O-Valley in Canada. Uh, Safe Sickle Point has been uh, fighting to acquire and conserve a 4.8-acre parcel of wetlands 
on the lake, which are home to many sensitive ecosystems and species. We know that Sickle Point is the last intact wetland on Ska, S-K-A-H-A, Ska, Skaya Lake, uh, and has rare plant communities like the common cattail marsh and the water birch wild rose. These rare plants provide critical habitat for the pallid bat, uh, the Lewis woodpecker and yellow b- breasted chat, which have also been <laughs> heard from kayakers that may have seen mussels in the water around Sickle Point. What is a chat? I mean, is that just a case? Is that Canadian speak? Eh? Is that? <laughs> Not a clue. Uh, I thought we'd check out the waters around Sick Point, see if we could find a rare mussel. It's only found in the Okanagan. Uh, they said the freshwater bivalves can filter up to 40 liters of water per day or 160 glasses of water. They are threatened by multiple factors, including invasive species like the zebras or the quagga mussels, and are subject to <coughs> excuse me, aggressive education and prevention campaigns on lakes up and down the valley every year. Ocean Tech Scuba and uh, Clayton stepped up to see if they could help locate some of the unique creatures near Sickle Point, seeing as a way to give back to community and live up to its commitment to the community to clean up local water systems. I remember as a kid going to Sickle Point and seeing that many frogs and turtles out there, owner Kevin Ashoff, Ashoff said, be a shame if it was sold or developed. On Sunday morning, Ashoff and four volunteer divers headed out in their boat. Within 45 minutes, divers had spotted and photographed 18 of the mussels, which are sent to be the Royal, sent to the Royal BC Museum for verification. Safe Sickle Point Committee was thrilled with success. More information about the committee species called Sickle Point Home and their fundraising campaign can be found here. So, huh. I, I, uh, I like the uh, art on his uh, pontoon boat. Oh, yeah. Now, if you are... So the the mussels are rare, but you're going to take 18 of them out and ship them away. Are they alive? I would think they are. Yeah, because you'd, you'd hate it's an endangered species. So let's let's categorize them and catalog them, and hopefully they don't kill them. In the... And see if they can grow. Yeah. See so if we can make some more. There you go. It's an interesting place. I went to the site, and it looks almost like a marshland where they're at. Uh huh. <clears throat> the whole waterway is surrounded by very large cattails, it looks like. Quite interesting. And then we have over 5,000 pounds of trash removed from beaches and deep cleaning initiative. Hundreds of citizens removed 4,962 items equivalent to 5,613.91 pounds of waste from over 15 reefs and beaches and islands rescued multiple marine organisms during the first massive and simultaneous deep cleanup in Puerto Rico, reported Anna Trillo, Executive Director, Scuba Dog Society, SDS. The initiative allowed debris to be removed from the coral reefs of Cayo Aurora, or Kilgan's Island, Playa El Natural, Crash Boat, a couple places I'm not even going to try and say, the beaches in Seven Seas, Melinda Park, yeah, read, read the article. We'll have links again in the show notes. Uh, 3,120 pounds of debris were removed, including 48 rubber bands. What? Is that, am I, I, they they kind of mean something more than... Uh, well, that's what band. I'm thinking. <laughs> like Some rubber bands, a stapler, paper clips. No, four mattresses, a jet ski, <laughs> several sofas, two televisions, other material. Deep cleaning operation was carried out uh, the past two weekends, since weather conditions prevented it from being completed in a single day as scheduled, this week we commemorate, uh, commemorate Earth Day, which was April 22nd. So by the time you listen to this, it already have happened. We are proud to report that these over 400 volunteers, in addition to captains, municipal employees, and public agencies, gave him the best possible gift cleaning reefs and, and beaches. 
She added, however, it is sad to see how items that are typically associated with happy moments and vital activities such as feeding and hydrating ourselves end up contaminating the very ecosystem that provides us with important services for our well-being. Our population, other people on the planet, depend on coral reefs because they protect us from natural disasters such as hurricanes. Uh, the result of this deep cleanup shows that garbage most frequently invades and threatens the reefs are in order priority beverage cans, glass bottles, plastic bottles, glasses, plates, plastic cutlery, also found in order of frequency, plastic fragments, food containers made of foam, and other plastic materials, rubber bands, gloves, and masks. Why do you suppose they found masks? <laughs> yeah. I, it wasn't long after the pandemic started and I was seeing masks everywhere. Oh, it's amazing just going to Myers and walking back to your car, how often you'll see not only masks, but gloves. People are still wearing gloves. Yeah, well, I mean, if that makes you feel better. But yeah, but why put them back on the pavement? Well, that's that's it. Uh, and, and then one thing they do have in the footnote is they say that rescued organisms are released in the sea. This rescue constitutes one of the most rewarding and educational parts of the day. We've come direct wilderness of harmful effects of waste on marine species and the importance of reverting these effects into our ecosystem, she said. So, good job. I mean, that's significant. In, in looking for articles for this week, I found one that had divers in Hawaii, and I had to triple check it because they had cleaned up five pounds of trash was their accomplishment. I'm like, I, I can't really, we can't make a big deal hey, about five pounds. One tire, come on, one yeah. tire. Yeah, I mean, I guess if it's that it was that clean and you're, but yeah, I I don't I don't necessarily think it was. So, okay. This next one, not everyone is on board with the plan to sink a centrally century old ferry into Lake Champlain. There are more than three hundred shipwrecks in Lake Champlain. One vessel appeared to set to join the ranks of over. 100 years of operation. Adirondack Ferry was built in 1913. It's cruised reliably across Lake Champlain from Burlington to Port Kent, New York, since 1954. A dwindling daily passenger load for Lake Champlain transportation means that the Adirondack days are numbered, but it appeared it could have a new life as a scuba diving destination. Uh, they're saying it's kind of a museum piece, and I hate to just cut it up in the scrap. Uh, according to John Paul, the company's port engineer. In the past three years, Paul had been a driving force for the Lake Champlain Transportation Company's plan to eventually submerge the Adirondack, hoping that storied history will draw divers from around the region and provide a modest boost to local economy. We're optimistic. We think this is a great project. It has benefits that we can't even foresee at this point. I've seen so many vessels made in museums or restaurants, and the very often things go awry. They aren't maintained the way they should be. Paul and his colleagues finally secure a permit to sink the ship last month from Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, a big step in a lengthy approval process he referred to as a labor love. Not everyone has such a keen outlook in the ship's final resting place. However, the Vermont Legislature Senator Brian uh, was it Campion, uh, Democratic from Democrat from Bennington has made it clear he isn't on board. It could have serious environmental impacts to the lake. It's stressed body of water known already a number of different pollutants, said Crampton. In my opinion, seeking it doesn't seem to pass the straight face test in any way. Senator Campton isn't much of there isn't much in the legislature can do at this late in the process, but some lawmakers are hoping to change the approval process to prevent similar occurrences in the future. In a way, it's up to the public, said uh, Senator uh, Campion. If the public continues to express concern, it's possible people could pull back these plans, but there isn't legislative way to stop from moving forward. Paul said pending approval from the, sur the city of uh, Burlington and several other checkpoints, the Adirondack is scheduled to sink in June 2022, making a new chapter in lengthy history of the oldest continually operating double-ended ferry in the U.S., she sailed Jacksonville, New York City, Philadelphia, and Chesapeake Bay. She was 41 years old when she came here in 1954. That was before I was born, and I'm pretty old, he said. 
Uh, I posted a picture of it, and uh, it's quite interesting. I dive that little sucker. Did they say how deep they were going to put it? They they didn't. They didn't say how deep it was going to be. Uh, uh, I, I did go to Discord, loaded it so I could put the picture in yeah. it. Uh, this is an old fashioned picture. It looked like the 1950 cars in it, but it looked like, you know, flat bottom engine in the back uh, with a deck up on top. Mm -hmm. And then the people can promenade around it, plus the captain's controls up there in the front. Nice little tower. Yeah, I'd die that little sucker. Yeah, let me see. I'm gonna, and it should be pretty safe because it's open. Yeah, I'm gonna see if I can get. The, oh, I can. Here, here, we're gonna try this. So, all those times you've heard Mac talk about a photo that you didn't get to see, here we go. We're gonna get this one showing. So, there it is. Yeah, that's that's a nice one. Uh, Oh yeah, I do. You dive that little sucker. Yeah, that would be too bad. Let me see no, if let me see if all. I can zoom that up a little bit here. Ooh, there we go. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. Uh, and and this kind of highlights why anybody who's doing this sort of sinking has to get people on board because you have to make it so that. All the political parties are for this. Uh, if you mm -hmm. if you don't, then you end up with that where they're uh, they're just going to say, "Oh, that's you're you're dumping trash." They don't see the value of having something like that. It's in the water uh, for people to dive on and enjoy after it's it's had its useful life. Well, it doesn't look like that'd be really hard to clean because there's no weird interiors to it, you know. Yeah, it's 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 fairly well open, uh, and the thing is, when you intentionally seek it, you can clean it. So you can take care of most of the items that somebody would be concerned with. You know, this is in the age of asbestos, so I don't mm -hmm. know what kind of requirements are for sinking it. But you know, normally nowadays, is you're taking the asbestos off. Other than asbestos in the water, it's about the safest place for asbestos. Uh, uh, well, and then it's not going to be friable. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's 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 non-friable, and I mean, it came from the environment in the first place, so you're kind of returning it. Uh, you're more concerned with the petrols, you know, the oils and stuff, and then you're gonna have some people gonna be concerned about lead, but you know, you you're probably talking such a small amount, you're gonna be fine. Uh, So well, let's see. Was was that it? Do we have anything more? Yeah, yeah. Didn't you have one on uh, glass bottom boat? Yeah, glass bottom boat tours. This one I'd say is kind of you know nearly in our backyard. Uh, glass bottom shipwreck boat tours preparing for the summer. Company's first tours of the seasons are slated for Memorial Day weekend with COVID nineteen protocols in place. And this is out of Munising, Michigan. Uh, you know, a, a traditional stomping grounds for uh, many in the Great Lakes diving. All ashore are going ashore. Memorial Day weekend is approaching, means that tourism is soon to return to the Upper Peninsula. The Glass Bottom Shipwreck Tours of Munising co-owner Pete Lindquist says he and his crew are preparing to welcome back customers, but tours will look different than in past years. If you're on the upper deck in the open air, you don't have to wear a mask when you're seated. But if you're inside the enclosed space where the viewing wells are, then you'll have to wear a mask. Last year, tourism in the UP and Glass Bottom continued its expeditions with limited capacity. However, there was a downside. We kept it at one third. We were filled with every tour every day. We probably turned away twice as many on a daily basis. Lindquist hopes the company can start the season with 50% capacity on each boat with customers spaced out during the tour. Despite these measures, he believes this summer it's going to be another good one. I'm thinking because of the online reservations from what I've seen of that, that we're going to have another banner year. In the meantime, Lindquist and his company will be keeping their eyes on the horizon. I'm just hoping that we have great weather. We have lots of people. We don't have any issues with COVID. I would love to see this whole situation kind of open up so life can get back to normal. Uh, Glass Bottoms for Shipwreck Tours will set sail on May 29th. Uh, I've never done a Glass Bottom boat tour. 
but uh, I've done them in Florida. Yeah, and I think uh, didn't Ke uh, Kevin and Amy go up and do that also? They said it was pretty awesome on a nice day. Mm -hmm. The water were a little cleaner here. It'd be nice to do that over the river, so you know where to go for the bottles. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of scrubbing through their video here. See if I oh there's a there's the glass bottom. That's one of them there. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Not not quite what I was thinking. What were you thinking? I don't. I guess I don't know. Uh, I was just like glass bottom. I mean, I mean we we've seen the. Uh, you know, that spray on stuff, you know, that's super seal or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's what you do. You stick like a big pitcher window and you spray some of that gasket stuff on and you've got a glass bottom boat. I thought that's how they yeah. did it. Something like that. Yeah, the one we were at almost was like a pontoon boat, but the bottom went below. So... You know, the, the plexiglass was under the water. Mm -hmm. It was pretty nice. Okay. I'm trying to think of the place. I, it's, it's, um, I can't, I'm trying to remember where it was at in Florida, but it's the same place they did a lot of pictures and movies. Oh, and, uh, uh, I know the one you're thinking of. I've been there. Oh, Sarasota Senior Springs. Moment. It might have been, yeah. Sarasota Springs. There's a, there's a few of them down there because there's there's about three or four of the world famous you know fifties and sixties resorts that are still yep. there. Uh, well, yeah. wait a minute, you're dating me now. <laughs> well, I mean, I was just there. I'd say just a little while ago, but it's been ten years since I was, I went down to Florida to do some cavern diving. Hard to believe, time is just ripping by. Especially when you lose oh, about a year and a half to the damn COVID. Oh, pain in the buttons, yeah. Yeah. Put it mildly. Well, that does it for Scuba the News. I think that worked out pretty painlessly. I mean, uh, leave us some comments down into the uh, chat if you liked it, didn't like it. Uh, I don't know how much blurring of the video I'm going to have to do in the final version. Uh to not get any copyright strikes or anything, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how this works out. Uh, and then we got the show notes so you can, you know, as you're following along, you can click and, and do it. And, yeah. and I don't even have a, a graphic for it, but, uh, maybe now's a, a perfect time. If you're enjoying this show, you like the format change or just want to support us, you can head on to our Patreon site. You can go to our website, www.scubobsess.com. Click on over to Patreon, and uh, those are the supporters. We we don't receive uh, sponsorship. You know, we're not sponsored by any big dive companies, trips, tourism, anything like that. We do this because we enjoy it, and we hope that you get some value on it. It does. It isn't free. <laughs> we we do spend money. Uh, you know, I had for years been running it just about even, but the last uh, few, as we keep trying new things, I, I have been. Uh, increasing the cost you know the hosting uh we've upgraded the hosting so that's a little bit better a little bit quicker uh and now we're going to video so there's been a uh, cost of equipment and then we'd like to upgrade the equipment uh, what we'll we'll be doing with this video is as we get back out and doing some diving uh, we're going to be able to share some of those dives in the stream so you can see what's been what's been going on so no, no, not tweaking you or anything like that. But when we do that, I want to make sure you wear that pristine dive suit you have. Oh, yeah. People, people will see that you're not frivolously. At NC seventeen rating is for things. that video. You know, a little. Anybody want to see a little little thigh hanging out of a wetsuit? Then, yeah. I was thinking more of the hairy back. But the hairy back. Well, that becomes a horror movie. There, that's more like uh, Godzilla or uh, Hong, uh, King Kong. So. Well, I was just checking the uh, water temperature at the cook plant today, uh -huh. and it was 49 degrees on the surface. So you know, you need a wetsuit if it's totally intact, maybe. Still dry suit weather, though. So is, that was a cook buoy? 
Yep, it's both of them are on station. I checked out the ones for uh, South Haven, um, obviously Cook Plant and Michigan City, and uh, they're all reading pretty good today. I like the pictures too. Before you go back out, you can see what it gives you the sea state, but this with the picture it makes it a little more graphic. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's when it's six foot swells, you know, maybe you don't want to go do that. Okay. At least till it lays down. Conditions at the station. So this is station forty five zero two six as of April twenty second. So I'm showing that on the screen now so they can take a peek. So what are we seeing? Winds out of the south, 8.8 .8 knots. Gusting up to 10 knots. Air temperature's 49 right now. Uh, I didn't see the depth one like they used to do, though. Remember, they used to go down to 50 feet. It, it's it's on there. I did not see that. Is it? Yeah. Uh, I Yep. So the at 3.3 feet or about a meter, it's 45.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Down at the bottom, 55.8 feet is 45.1 degrees. So it's pretty much flat all the way down right now. No thermoclines have appeared to have formed. Mm -hmm. So what would that mean for Viz? Would that be pretty clear or mess? It kind of depends on what's been happening the last three days. So the winds out of the south, uh, really the best is when the winds out of the east. Uh... Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say. Well, I'm sure some of the diehards are going to be out there pretty soon. Yeah, I, I, I bet. I, I mean, we're to that time of the year. April, I mean, March is early. April is about right. Yeah, uh, that's when we start cutting into it. Yeah, so, you know, 40s. It's getting into 50, so, you know, it's still dry suit weather for most people, but. It's good to get started now because then as the season comes along, you're just thinking of how how warm that will be. It'll be tropical. When it starts getting in the high 50s, you'll just won't know what to think. Ooh, here, I can, I'll share this as well. Here, you know, some, some graphs. They're Mr. Plots. Yeah. Now, all you got to do, though, is look for NOAA buoys, Lake Michigan. And that'll show you all the ones around the lake, and then you can easily pick out where you want. Michigan City, yeah, us. Yeah. Yep. So this is uh, this one's a Michigan Technol Michigan Tech University. Is who does this one? So, well, very cool. So, anybody getting any diving in that you're aware of? I haven't. I don't know that. I think Kevin went out a couple of weeks ago, but he was more. Actually, he did get wet. Uh, they were back up, checking some of the uh, rivers that used to be one way, meaning you could go in, but you're deadheaded. Mm -hmm. With a rise in the water, they were navigable again. So he was back out looking for some uh, shoreline shipwrecks. And if you look at the old maps, especially the ones that uh, late 1800s. Mm -hmm. there is a tremendous number that were just put up on shore, burned on shore, and they're now finding them because people are looking for them because they want to. Well, how many times in the last 50 years had somebody just stepped over the log thinking, oh, that's nothing, that's just some scrap. But once the interest is there and somebody tells somebody else and you start learning where they're at and people look forward to seeing them because they, they kind of have these cycles. Yeah. But by the same token, I, I mean, it's hard for me to get excited about scrap wood, <laughs> especially when it's on shore because it's not going to last long. No. Like some of the ones we've been looking at where they got to dig four foot of sand and you look at it. I'm still more in line. If you put that same wreck though out at 50, 60 feet, then you've got more of it to look at. Right. So is that something we should try and push or promote? Yeah, reintroduce the wrecks to the lake. Because if it's on the beach, you know, if you know, you could, if it's in any sort of condition, you could haul it out and put it at 40, 50 feet, and that will uh, that will last another fifty, sixty years, easy. 
I've not seen that many you could do that because you're talking about grabbing it by the keel, yeah, being unsanded and then dragging it. That's going to be some. We can't afford to put buoys on the wreck. <laughs> the ones we got, drag one yeah, out. yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of Diamond Lake where uh, they had kind of reassembled the shipwreck yep. to kind of have it all in the same spot. Yep, it happens when you explode. Well, yeah, we're we're due. It's time to really get out there, get some diving in. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm seeing a lot of dive shops. I'm I'm glad to see they survived the last twelve months. Hopefully, they could make it through this spring and summer. H two O down there in uh, Goshen area. They were. Uh, I've been getting emails from them when I hadn't seen anything in you know six nine months. You know, Wolf's has been huh. doing quite a bit. He's keeping busy on dry suits, especially for fire departments, rescue mm -hmm. units. Yeah. And uh, we've got a couple of commercial firms in the area. So they he does a lot of work with regulators, tunes up. So um, they're not just languishing, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I understand is that a lot, just not like lumber, if you've been looking at lumber prices, that's going crazy. But there's I, a I keep seeing those means. Is that really true? Is that lumber? That yeah. Expensive? Well, well, what happened? I mean, here's a little sidetrack moment, because I've been I've been really interested in following this uh, is what happened in, when the pandemic started. I mean, because you got a lead time. You've got trees. You got to cut them down. You got to haul them to the mill. You got to, you know process them, dry them. So there's, there's a little bit of lead time. So when the pandemic started, uh, you know, a whole year ago now, uh, what they tell everybody do go home. Yeah. And many people continued to get paid or they worked from home, but then you also couldn't do a vacation, a vacation, uh, or that became your forced vacation. So what do you do when you're on normally you're on vacation, you spend money, you go places. Well, now, you know, long weekends or a week, I'm, I'm looking at the backyard going, you know, that would be, it's, you know, I'm, I'm stuck here anyway. Home Depot's open. Let me go get some wood. I'll work on a deck. And that's what everybody did. Yeah. Everybody went out and started doing all these projects. Uh, in the meantime, all your, your mills shut down like everybody else. So you created this delay. Uh, and it's just taken time. For, demand. Yeah. So it's a classic supply and demand. Now we're on the other end of it. Uh, and you've also got people who have put off all sorts of things, building homes, uh, you know, f fixing things. Uh, you know, there's just all sorts of activities that people are starting back up and it's putting a strain on the supply chains. Uh, so what you're saying is it pays, in my case, to be a procrastinator and not going to do any of that? <laughs> not last year. Uh, I mean, prices are still up. They're kind of high. I mean, uh, I know of uh, built, because it depends on some building contractors I know actually hoarded some, I say hoarded, they preemptively bought stuff because they saw prices were going up and, you know, they've they've already quoted four or five garages. So you buy the materials, you put them in your, your storage and then you've you've got them, and prices have continued to go up. And it's it's not just originally it was wood, it's moved over into uh, lighting, wiring. I haven't heard anything on plumbing and in windows yet, but I mean it's just it's going to happen. Uh, and that, but what then that happens is you got the other supply it's part of the supply curve. You know, I've got a roof, mm -hmm. I've got to put in my barn. Well, that's going to wait. So at some point. Uh, enough people have decided to wait that you've, you've driven the demand down. Uh, so well, see, I, that just to me is a built in excuse for why I don't have to do it. Yeah. Well, go, yeah. Use that. Use that. To, don't build that deck. Go out and go scuba diving is I think the moral of the story. Well, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, do you have a dive safety story for us this well, week? Actually, it's not a story, but it's one of those fact of life. And again, it's nothing we don't already know. It's nothing we don't talk about. But we've been talking about this basically and, and observing this for 50 freaking years. When are we going to learn? So let's talk scuba diving fatalities. 
Okay, scuba diving fatalities or death occurring while scuba diving or as a consequence of. The risk of dying during recreational, scientific, commercial diving, they're really small. And on scuba, deaths are usually accomplished or associated with poor gas management, poor buoyancy control, equipment misuse, entrapment, rough water, rough water conditions, pre-existing health conditions and problems. And again, some fatalities are inevitable and caused by unforeseeable situations escalating out of control, though the majority of diving fatalities can be attributed to human error on the part of the victim and generally by panic. Now, equipment failure is really rare in open circuit scuba. And while the cause of death is commonly recorded as drowning, this is mainly the consequence of uncontrollable series of events taking place in the water. Now, arterial gas embolism frequently cited as a cause of death, and it too is a consequence of other factors leading to uncontrolled, badly managed ascents. That and possibly aggravated medical conditions. About a quarter of the diving fatalities associated with cardiac events, mostly in older divers. It's a fairly large body of data on diving fatalities, 25%. But in many cases, the data is poor due to the standard of investigation and reporting. It hinders the research which could improve diver safety. Now, scuba diving fatalities have a major financial impact by the way of lost income if you're a dive organization and or individual who's hurt, lost business, higher insurance premiums, and high litigation costs. And that's just for the boat owner that didn't go do the diving but sort of got burned up in the, in the process. Diving fatality data published in Diving Medicine for Scuba Divers, 90% died with their weight belt on. 86% were alone when they dived. Now, they were either solo or separated from their buddy. 50% did not inflate their buoyancy compensators. 25% of those got into problems on the surface and 50% of them actually died on the surface. 10% were under training when they died. 10% were advised prior to their diving that they were medically unfit to dive. Only 5% were cave diving. And only 1% attempting to rescue died as a result of that attempt. Now, the causes of death, according to the death certificates over 80% of the deaths were ultimately attributed to drowning. The other factors usually combine to incapacitate the diver in a sequence of events culminating in their drowning. The drowning obscures a real cause of the death, which is unfortunate. Scuba divers should not drown unless there are contributing factors as they carry their supply of breathing gas and equipment designed to provide gas on demand. Cardiac disease, pulmonary barotrauma, unmanageable stress, unconsciousness, water aspiration, blood, injury, uh, blood trauma, equipment difficulties, environmental hazards, inappropriate response to emergency, or failure to manage gas supply. Those are the items. And again, nothing we haven't heard about, worked with, had a few sort of near misses on our own probably. In many diving destinations, resources are not available for comprehensive investigations or complete autopsies. Uh, the 2010 Dan Diving Fatalities Workshop noted that the listings of drowning as a cause of death is ineffective in determining what actually happened and what occurred in the accident. The lack of information is a primary reason for personal injury lawsuits filed in the industry. They said death usually followed a sequence or combination of events, most of which would have been survivable in isolation. More than 940 fatalities studied by Dan over the 10 years, only one third of the triggers could be identified, just a third. And the most common were insufficient gas, entrapment, snagged by seaweed, kelp, entanglement in 
suction pipes and gratings, and 15% were equipment problems. And disabling agents identified in one third of the cases, most commonly identified was emergency ascent, 55%, insufficient gas again, 27, and buoyancy issues, 13%. Disabling injuries were identified in nearly two-thirds of the cases. The criteria for identifying the disabling injury by forensic judgment are specified. Asphyxia, 33% with or without aspiration of water, and no evidence of a disabling injury. Triggering events associated with that is, again, entrapment in kelp, wreckage, mooring lines, fishing lines, nets, Entrapment in confined spaces or under the ice. 32% for insufficient gas. When it was first identifiable, uh, identifiable problem, but the reason for the lack of gas was not determined with the exception of lost in caves, lost in wrecks. 15% problems uh, were with the equipment included regulated free flow and therefore unexpected high gas consumption diver error in the use of the equipment, lack of use of the buoyancy compensator, weighting system, or dry suit. And 11% for rough water conditions, including high sea states, strong currents, and almost after the dive, before and after, the surf conditions where you get beat up, getting out of the beach, on the beach, especially on rocky shores, and smashed into piers. Uh, so they talked about other contributing factors not clearly connected. Panic uh, was reported in the fifth of the cases because that was observed. Casualties uh, were diving alone, separated from their buddies, and 40% of the cases with asphyxia, but also associated with other disabling injuries. Cardiac incidents, 26% where chest discomfort was indicated by the diver, distress displays with no obvious or cause of cardiac disease. So if you're not feeling good and you're, you're sort of hurting in the body, you really shouldn't be out there trying to get wet. Thinking, well, if I get in the water, I'll feel better, the tightness will go away because it's my suit. It's not always the suit. Decompression sickness was only 3.5% based on symptoms, signs, and autopsy findings. And those were attributed to insufficient gas, emergency ascent, repetitive dives with a short in uh, surface interval, short interval, gas loss in free flow, uncontrolled ascent in dry suit due to exhaust malfunction, dragged deep by a spearfish, not a lot of those, but that's one of the aspects, let the darn thing go. Uh, DCS was associated with deep diving, diving alone, emergency ascent without having to take time to do their decompression. Uh, they were talking about un uh, unexplained loss of consciousness. Two and a half percent were divers were discovered unconscious without obvious cause. And they believe the triggers may have included deep dives, diabetes, nitrox dives, Seizure at depth because of partial pressure, oxygen partial pressure. Uh, let's see, frequent diving and, oh, beginner divers. Key item, I don't think there's anything that we have not talked about. And in many cases, how many times could you say you almost did one of those? And again, key item for us, especially excited, not excited, but experience or non-experience is panic something induced panic whereas yeah. a normal condition you'd been fine yeah yeah i mean uh, it, probably this the single largest cause of death diving i would have to say would be panic yeah it's that's how you react to the situation if you got air you got time but again how many times can you just sit back and think okay i may have actually got in without my mask or it fell off or did I have my tank all the way on? I mean, 
you can see yourself in a lot of those scenarios, mm -hmm. but you caught them and you knew what to do about them. Yeah. Yeah. But that weight belt one still freaks me out. 90% still have their weights. Yeah. That ditch the way. The other one is, how come you didn't put air in your inflator? That's two of the biggies. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have a mouse a mouse running here on the table. I, I need picture, picture. well I need to have a mouse cam. Yeah. I saw the shadow. Uh yeah. So I'll have to get the external camera going for next time. Uh. Yeah, so those are all good tips. Uh, and then Derek in the chat room, Mac, I pasted some links and we'll share these with the, uh, uh, those watching. Uh, so there are two videos that he had. I had seen one of these before, but uh, it's fighting or something else. On, on the video. Oh, the sand doctor. Yeah. Sand doctor. Yeah. So, uh, oh. you little bugger. Here he is. Let me see if I can. I don't know. Would you be comfortable driving in that stuff? It looks very dark. Yeah, what, diving in that water like that? Well, yeah, I mean, that, well, you know, the weeds, we don't bother because we know there's nothing out there bigger than us. Not sure I'd want to be out there and that kind of stuff. Oh, I like that nighttime one. Oh, those are cool. Cool. But he, yeah. I, I've always had fun doing night dives, but it's certainly a uh, a different experience. Well, I mean, I like night diving, but I'm talking about where there's animals bigger than is me. He, how big is this guy? Is this guy really bigger? I wouldn't put my hand out of that. My luck would be one of those little pink ones, or what do they call them? The, the blue octopus that mm -hmm. are very deadly. Those guys are fighting, so I don't know. You don't want to come to two of them, between the two of them. It's fault like that. Uh, I mean, I, I've you? heard of it. I can't say that I'm... Uh that familiar let's see and he had another one i haven't this is one i haven't watched so Well, I've got my critter cam set up, but of course, now that I'm all prepared, he's not going to be back. Okay. Well, I think we've we've about done it, haven't we? Is there anything else? I yeah, anything so. you want to plug before we we get on to it? No, but I sure hope to get diving, if not this weekend, but at least next weekend. Yep. So, yeah, I agree. Yep, it's it's certainly time. Robotic season is pretty much over. We're just, I mean, we're in all your activity, but. As far as the the every night meetings, I'm I'm down to just a couple a week, mm -hmm. so that's nice. So I'd say we we're to that time of the show. Yep. And normally, 
nobody can see a smirk until now. Already, whenever you are. Act, yeah, actually, I'm going to try something before we do that. Uh, your video has locked up, so I'm going to try and fix my that. video. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's probably on my side, so I'm going to try and get that going again. I just realized I got to stop rocking my feet because that makes me look like I'm going back and forth. Oh, I know. I got all sorts of quirks. It's when I watch this back. I'll I'll send you a link. Uh, because it's it's unlisted. I'm gonna have to do some. Just thinking out loud while you're doing that. Uh huh. The simple act of carrying a good bailout bottle. Yep. With a good regulator, should minimize how many people drowning? Fifty percent. Oh yeah. Because if you don't run out of air, you're not gonna try to do a emergency ascent. You got time, like you said. You got air. You got time. Practice breathing off your BC. Easier said than done, but. Let's see. I'm, I'm playing with some settings here, so we'll see what this does. Say, say what are you doing? Uh, here we go. Here we go. So now, now you should be fine. You're coming back. I should be fine? Yeah, yeah we were. Yeah, we, we just need to get that expression when you hear this joke so are you ready okay so little johnny was sitting in class and he remembers to himself that he was up way late the night before and was watching the late show he remembers that it was a joke about red roses and he just didn't get it he turned to little susie and says what are red roses R red roses susie starts crying and she runs to the teacher teacher stops at class and asks susie what's wrong she told the teacher that little Johnny asked her what red roses were. Appalled, the teacher demanded little Johnny goes to the principal office at once. Little John, Johnny gets to the principal's office, and Mr. Principal asked him why he was sent. Johnny told the principal, and he asked little Susie a question, and he told the teacher, and the teacher sent the office. The principal asked what the question was, and little Johnny told him, I asked what red roses were. Outraged, the principal sends Johnny home. Johnny gets home and his mother asks why he was out of school. Johnny told her he asked little Susie a question. She told the teacher. Teacher sent him to the principal's office. Principal sent him home. His mother asked what the question was. At this point, Johnny was reluctant in telling, but he finally said, well, I, I asked what red roses were. His mom shrieked and sent him to his room without supper. Totally confused at this point, he decides to sneak out and ask his neighbor, little Tim, a question because they're best friends. And Tim would never tell on Johnny. As he crosses the street, he gets hit by a bus. What's the moral of the story? Look both ways before crossing the street. I needed a little more than that. <laughs> that let me see. I don't. Let me. Do I have a backup? Wow. I've I've got one. It's it's ridiculously long and it's worse than that. Let's let's see. Do we want to do that one? I don't know. That's not going to be a long. <laughs> What's that? I don't know about worse than that. You don't think it'd be worse? Okay. Uh, In World War One, the Polish had an air force. One day, the the top flying ace was in a briefing, and his commander invited him to go to interrogation camp of a German pilot he had shot down. After seeing the man tortured for information, the Polish ace was in tears because a German pilot had flown with great honor and skill, and he had been bested fairly. The ace did not believe the German pilot deserved to be treated like this, so he lingered after everybody else had left the day, uh, the day to offer solace to the wounded German. After a half an hour discussion, two pilots became friendly and sharing similarities of their lives, and the German pilot dropped this bombshell. They say if I don't tell them where Central Command is, they'll cut my left leg off. I don't know where it is. I've just been to the airfield, so they're going to cut off my leg. I know I'm going to die, but I'd like my body to be returned to Germany. Would you do it to me to honor the dropping of my leg over Germany on your next sortie? The Polish ace responded, I don't know. I could get in trouble for this. Oh, well, you'll only be one time. I might as well. So the next day after torture-based amputation, the Polish ace carried the severed limb to drop it over Munich. Immediately after doing so, the enemy... Uh, plane flies right in the crosshairs for an easy kill. 
After his mission, he returned a German pilot and told him where his leg was dropped. Excellent. My uncle lives in Munich. Oh, that makes the news I just received more bearable. My torture just told me if I didn't tell him where the Army's fuel depots were that they'd cut off my right leg. I don't know where any fuel depots are. Just come in and fuel my plane. Can you drop my leg over Germany, my friend? The Polish ace responds, Damn it, I thought it was just a one-time thing. Well, I might as well. I've already done it once and I didn't get in trouble. What's the harm? The next day, the ace delivers the special cargo over Frankfurt and then reprieve the previous day. An enemy plane wanders in the crosshairs and is rapidly dispatched. The ace returns to the base feeling like he's done a good thing both for his soul and for his country. Upon telling the German prisoner the location of his leg, a smile spreads across his face. Ah, Frankfurt. Frankfurt. My first love lived there. Truly a beautiful woman, so kind. Uh, well, it was 20 years ago, and I'm still married to that wonderful woman. The man sighs contently and continues, Thank you, my friend. You've buoyed my spirits immediately after the news I just received. What's that? The Polish pilot asked. Well, I've just learned unless I tell them where our training bases are, they're going to cut off my left arm and I didn't even go through training. I sent straight to the air base for my training. It was quite literally the only place in Germany war machine I've seen. Uh, they're going to cut off my arm once again. Uh, would you do the honor of dropping my arm over Germany so my spirit may have a place to return to the country that I love so much? Damn it, the ace explained. I just can't keep doing this. I'm going to be found out and then they're going to be shot as a sympathizer. Oh, well, I've had a good life. On his next sortie, uh, the Polish ace drops the de detached arm over Berlin then it has come, that has become normal for the situation. German plane dances in his crosshair. He returns it to the earth rather forcefully. Ah, Berlin, my hometown. My mother lives there. You know, my mother, she used to give me chocolate for being a good boy. Thank you for this, my brother. Even though my body will never fly again, my soul remains in the heavens forever, the news you have given me. Alas, I've been informed my right arm will soon be removed. They stopped trying to get information out of me. They're just being jerks now. Will you drop my arm over Germany? Oh, you got to be kidding me. I've dropped a leg over Munich, one over Frankfurt, one over Ber... Hey, wait a minute. I know what you're doing. You're trying to escape piece by piece. Uh, pretty sure they're going to call him Bob. <laughs> uh, so w were you sure the f second one wasn't worse than the first one? <laughs> that barrel's got to be scraped clean by now uh, I mean are we are we good for one more I mean nobody's going to be watching this they're just going to be hitting the fast <laughs> forward button uh, go for it Yeah, here we go Captive audience. yeah they can't get away once there's a conductor of a youth orchestra he had trouble controlling his temper sometimes would lash out violently one day while in rehearsal the first violin player was just playing out turn for no reason Conductor got so angry, he kicked a violin player so hard that he died. The conductor was convicted and sentenced to death. For his last meal, the conductor ordered a dozen bananas. The guard was a bit perplexed, but hey, it's his last meal. Conductor ate the bananas, went on the way to the chair. They turned on the juice to let him fry. But the conductor lived. In this particular place, you live through execution, you are set free. So the conductor been out, went back to what he does best, conducting Although he still had violent issues, one fateful day, the left uh, last chair flutist could play, and he got fed up and threw a music stand at her and killed her. Moving forward to death row, he had the same prison guard look at him the last meal. Again, he ordered 12 bananas. The guard was really puzzled but filled the order. Not only that, but the conductor lived through another electric chair. For the, third, for the third time, the conductor was back in the podium, but the snare drum was just being loud conductor threw his baton at the poor drummer and she fell dead with a baton in the eye. The conductor found himself once again in a small cell ordering a dozen bana bananas. This time the guard couldn't take it anymore. I've given you three last meals each time you order 12 bananas. I've never seen anyone live through the electric chair. Did the bananas help? Asked the guard. The conductor looked up from his seventh banana and replied, no, I just really like bananas. The guard was shocked and how the hell do you keep living through all these electric chair? Because I'm a bad conductor. Saw that one coming. Yeah, I knew. It's, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, we've probably done that one before, but yeah, the, the barrels runneth dry. So, 
Let me, let me see what the, the, the funny thing is a chat room <laughs> is they're, they're probably a joke behind us. Uh, Oh we dear! Should, we should be able to see their expressions. We need <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> well, we could put them into the into the room, so we can know if we're going to be gross or not. Yeah, little warning. So I say, on that note, go out there and get wet, and most importantly, stay safe. Remember, the life you save could be mine. Yes. Oh, here we go. So what happened now? I covered up my uh, intro logo. Is this where the pumpkin comes across when we turn into pumpkins? <laughs> yeah. Oh, what is it? Wow. Yeah, I did. We did. Okay, and I'm going to stop recording here.